Uncle Dan. Hello. How, how you doing there? Oh, you know, here I am. Uh, I'm great, but I could use I could use something peppy in my life. Well, you know what I like is well, I like a that? I like a chestnut. You know what I mean? Sure. I like oh a, yeah. I like a I like a bromide. Oh yeah, a, a little a little uh, a little a little happy thought. A little life lesson. You know, something a bit longer than a fortune cookie, but a little shorter than a good talking to. I suppose. Sure, sure. Yeah. Who do, who doesn't like that? Yeah. It's uh it it it's instructional, it's inspirational. Yeah. If only we had something like that to oh, go well. on. <laughs> well, dear uncles, um I, I'm I'm here to help finally once again. Yeah, for Ooh. fuck's uh, sake. <clears throat> yeah, I mean like a cold sore or a bumbling former mayor of New York, I'm back, baby. <laughs> I want to thank you two for carrying on in my absence and I want to give a special shout out to Frank and Lauren who put their shoulders to the wheel and helped carry the load. No, it was it was great actually. It was nice. Yeah. It was it was actually pretty refreshing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you guys. Uh but most of all I want to thank all the listeners who stuck it out these past few weeks with what must have sounded like the Beatles made up only of Ringo's <laughs> or a Transformer movie with all the action edited out, leaving only the exposition, or like watching Top Gun without the soundtrack or the super macho not at all extremely gay volleyball scene. Or a monster truck rally with nothing more than electric mopeds. Or any Pink Floyd album before Dark Side of the Moon. Okay, I think we're good. Or season eight of Game of Thrones. Yeah. I, I could go on. <clears throat> no I, need. You're clearly, yeah. I mean, delusion has no boundaries, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've been gone a few weeks. What did I miss? Anything happen while I was gone? Uh, no, it was pretty <laughs> uneventful. Yeah? Like, uh, yeah, not, not a lot happened. All right. <clears throat> well... In spite of that, I got today's subject from the mouth of our soon-to-be normal president, Joseph Rosenthal, Rosenthal Biden. Rosenthal. It's, I don't know if what isn't it. Kind of, it's not Rosenthal. <coughs> it's like Robinette. it's like Robin something. It's Robinette. It's I think it's his mother's Robinette. Maiden. That's his mother's what it is. Name. Oh, cute. Uh, who, in his first speech after uh, it was announced that America had decided to return to the norm of voting for white male presidents after flirting with one African American and one villainous vermilion virus vector. <laughs> <coughs> Although he merely referenced scripture, saying that to everyone, uh, to, saying that to everything there is a season, he was specifically quoting the book of Ecclesiastes, which is what I want to talk about today. Mm. I think he was quoting. I I hate to, to call you out, Uncle Doug, but I'm pretty sure he was quoting a song by the Birds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. Okay. Um, it it always kind of galls me. How come um, nobody's ever done to there? Uh, there's always a seasoning. There's a time. You know what I mean? Like a spice company. Maybe a time that's what the, for every season. Yeah, yeah. The think about the missed uh, crossover um, sponsorship opportunity for a band called The Birds, not to have a song called "To Everything There Is a Seasoning." Right. Yeah, and they yep. could sell that at, at Four Seasonings Allspice uh, <laughs> wholesale. <clears throat> exactly right, off Route 16. Yeah. So it it always kind of galls me when religious people say, as Scripture says. As though all verses in the Bible are all the same. Mm -hmm. If nothing else in this show, we have demonstrated that all Bible verses were not created equal. Some do indeed extol virtues and admonish evil, while others encourage the reader to bash infant babies on rocks. It's a mixed bag. <sighs> However, in the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes is widely regarded as one of the good books in the good book. And given the fact that it clocks in at a mere 12 short chapters, it at least adheres to Uncle Doug's first rule of the Bible. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I have decided to claim all the short books in the Bible, leaving you with no choice but to slog your way through Proverbs and Isaiah. So, yeah, dibs. Yeah. <laughs> However, the book is also considered to be good or at least not actively harmful because it contains some of the most iconic and poetic verses in the whole sloppy mess. Although it is a mighty lowered bar, today I'm going to prove these people correct. Ecclesiastes may be the best book in the Bible, but not at all for the reasons they think. Mm. <laughs> uh, except uh, maybe for the book of Job, this book is the most depressing, the bleakest, the most hopeless, and the most dismal book in the whole Bible. The fact that most religious people consider it to be sublime tells us two things. Wait, Ecclesiastes? Yes. Oh, I thought you yes. said it was the nice one. It. Well, I said it's good. I didn't say oh. it was nice. Oh, okay. Um, and the fact that most religious people think it's a, the sublime book in the Bible tells us two things. They haven't read it. And they really do need some more excitement in their lives. The book was written sometime bet between 450 and 200 BCE and is one of the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible. 
It is considered one of the wisdom books, along with Lamentations and the Song of Solomon, for some reason, mm-hmm. for example. It gets its name from the word ecclesia in Greek, which means assembly or the assembled. And it's obviously the root, term, root of the term ecclesiastical. <clears throat> the book was for centuries popularly thought to be authored by King Solomon himself. However, modern scholars have rejected this, not least because Solomon in all likelihood never lived. But the book, the book does begin with, quote, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So one can be forgiven for thinking the book was written by who the book says it was written by. Yeah. But I digress. Uh, the book itself is a set of reflections by a king named Koheleth on his life, his futile attempts at happiness, and the utter pointlessness of human existence. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's not a happy story. Mm. <laughs> right out of the gate in verse 2, we are in for a bit of a gloomy adventure with, quote, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit, pro, what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. We um, <laughs> He goes on to lament that Dust life is a sin. in the wind. <laughs> exactly. All it's very are. much. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> he goes on to lament that life is essentially pointless and that, quote, there is, no, there is no new thing under the sun, which he says something like 30 times in this book. <clears throat> uh, in what will become a theme of the book, Koheleth, laments that the search for wisdom will eventually and inevitably lead to sorrow. Quote, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. That which is wanting cannot be numbered. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increase, increase, increaseth knowledge increaseth, sor- increaseth sorrow. Did you just have a stroke? I, I think I did. <laughs> no, I just left the toast on. Stroke a genius. <laughs> <laughs> In chapter two, uh, begins with Koheleth lamenting the ephemeral nature of his accomplishments and the fact that laughter, wine, singers, fountains, musical instruments, and great works did nothing to make him ultimately happy. Oh, Clearly, wow. he never met a Boda box. <laughs> <laughs> he complains that owning great numbers of livestock brought him no happiness. And because this is the Bible, neither did owning droves of slaves. Even when the slaves were born in his own house unto slavery, it didn't cheer him up. Poor what guy. Do you, like, you know, it's the, the age-old adage, which is probably from Ecclesiastes, what do you get the guy that has everything? Exactly. <clears throat> he Not more slaves, in, apparently. Right. Yeah. Uh, now I've now I got to go back to the drawing board on that one. Exactly. He wallows in the fact that for the wise men and the fool, for the rich men and the poor, the end is all the same, death. We chapter three begins with one of the most famous and off quoted passages in the entire Bible. Well, just Uncle a sec, though. He was living during Bible time. Truly. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. I mean, even for a king, it must have been really shitty. Super shit. Right. And really, the if worst. the Bible is if the Bible has taught us one thing, it stunk. <laughs> That's um, right. As we discussed with, with Lauren, the Bible is about three things ointments good, women bad, birds worse. Birds exactly. are the terrible. Yeah. Exactly. So chapter three begins with one of the most famous and oft quoted passages in the entire Bible, <clears throat> quote, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to, and a time to gather stones together a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, like right now, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Can I just say, I get the uh, the, the literary technique of, uh, of repetition sure. of a theme, <clears throat> but oh my God, shut up. We get it. I know, right? This is like the most Buddhist thing in the Bible, right? Well, here's the thing about that. Yeah. Um, That all seems really nice, not least uh, least because it was the passage that Kevin Bacon read to the Beaumont City Council in Footloose (laughs) to try and get them to just let the kids dance. (laughs) (laughs) And no doubt, as Uncle Uncle Dan said, you will also recognize these passages as the lyrics to the bird song, Turn, Turn, Turn. The whole song is lifted from this text except for the last line, a time for peace, I swear it's not too late. Mm. Um, however, 
the fact is that the author is actually wrestling with the fact that beauty fades and the cold, icy scythe of death comes for us all. It's not actually the Zen-like pearl that everyone thinks it is, but an acknowledgement that everything that grows will die and everything good will end. The pa- it should be renamed, <laughs> It All Sucks, What's the Point? It's pretty much it. This passage is off-quoted as a hopeful message that as bad as things might be, they will get better. However, it's just as easy to see the opposite, that however good things might be, something terrible is bound to come. And given the headspace that Kohalith is in, it seems pretty clear that it's the latter. It's kind of like when people play Every Breath You Take for their wedding song. Exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, the chapter ends with these uplifting verses, quote, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth the beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one, uh, the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breast, so that a man hath no preeminence above the beast. For all is vanity... All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all return to dust again. <laughs> Sorry. You do not want to hire it. this guy as a mall Santa. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, this is where we get the funerary, funerary recitation, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Although it's not quite as d- depressing as Mo Sislak's recitation that he taped to his back when he stuck his head in a stove. No funeral. <laughs> 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 Chapter 4 starts off with two verses that should be tattooed on the forehead of every Christian who voted for Trump once or twice. Quote, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and beheld the tears of such that were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of the oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. <laughs> Was this written by me in my teenage years? No, or just last week. Do you know what would be awesome to do is to print up some really legit um, looking Hallmark cards with some of this, like some of the really shitty stuff in Ecclesiastes in them and just kind of tuck them in yeah, among exactly. the other Hallmark cards, don't you think? I, lo- I love that. It'd be a very yes what, man what kind of. What section of the card shop does this fit into? Uh, condolences, but what's the point, I guess? <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Existential crisis? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, later in chapter four, there is one of the most beautiful arguments I've read in a long time for being allowed to love, to love whomever you love. Hmm. Quote, two are better than one because they have a good reward in the, for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. So it it's kind of like, yeah, just, you know, be with somebody, be happy, but whatever. Chapters five and six are prescient enough of the life and administration of Donald J. Trump that it's almost enough to make me believe that the writer was, re- was ref- re- referencing him directly. <laughs> then I remember that this is part of the Bible that's being thumped by his followers. The writer rages against the rich, the gluttonous, those who tell lies, those who don't honor vows or contracts, and that regard themselves greater than everyone else by virtue of their wealth. Hmm. Wow. That Over, is, yeah. That's yeah. kind of a little on the news. Bo a bit on Biden. the news. <laughs> um, oh, Hunter. Over, sorry, Bo's dead. <laughs> yeah, I was going to oh. say. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wrong one. Oh. Over and over again as I read these chapters, I just kept thinking of Donald Trump and how on earth one could read these passages and think to themselves, nah, not him. Yeah. Chapter 7 begins with, a, with, with Kohalath admonishing the powerful not to listen to, to like suck-ups of the world. Quote, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of the fools. For as hmm. the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This is also vanity. Um, but lest we forget that this is the Bible, we get this gemstone in verse 26. <clears throat> Quote, this is so fucked up. And I find more better, I find more bitter than death, the woman whose heart, <laughs> heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Wow. So there you Whoa. go. Just in case you were wondering. I don't want to hear what he has to say about birds. <laughs> <laughs> It just, okay, it, we've 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 now ventured out of like just sort of standard teenagehood and into uh, uh, yeah, like uh, four, fourteen, God, fifteen. Yeah, damn it, I just can't. I uh, what are the guys? 
The incels? Oh, in, incels. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, God totally. damn it. He's the king of the incels, Corey Horror, whoever this guy is. Kohaleth. Yeah. Coco Beam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, chapter eight is, is this is crazy, is Kohaleth wrestling, unsuccessfully, I might add, with the problem of evil. Mm. Ah. Yes. I, quote, there is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said this is also vanity. Then I, com- then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For that shall abide with him of his labor this days of his life, which God giveth him under the sun. So this whole chapter is him talking about why do bad things happen to good people mm-hmm. and why do good things happen to bad people, and he doesn't have an answer. Right. It's... it. I, why is this book in the Bible? I don't understand. I think he needs to like talk to somebody and have a kind of get some perspective on what he considers the greatest crime in the world, which is vanity. Right. Yeah. Which as obviously the Bible means is self regard, right? But, uh, yeah, exactly. And as a woman, a woman hating slave owner, you you might be right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and and the, the eat, drink, and be merry is part of that. It's interesting. Um, right. Which is which is taken to be this kind of jolly. Uh, you know, commandment to enjoy what is good from the earth, but it's that's not what the context is here. No, it's basically it's straight up saying, no matter how good you are, evil might befall you, so fuck it. Yeah. Enjoy yourself while you can. Why I is like this the Bible? That. I've always heard this sort of eat, drink, and be merry to be like kind of the hedonist's cry, mm. but apparently it's just it's just like give up now, might as well enjoy the, the, the pleasures of the flesh. Because you're be- going to die. Because you're gonna die. Yeah. Yep. And that's not that's not this is not the Bible shaming that position, but rather taking that position. Right. But, but from a really yeah, but from a from such a dark existential place, rather than kind of celebrate the time we have, you know, the way we would say it, like celebrate the time you have now, because there won't be any more. Exactly. Right. This is just like fuck it, nothing matters. Yeah. Fuck so, Mary Kill, whatever you yeah, want. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's where this podcast would have gone had Trump won. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if that's all not dark enough for you, I give you chapter nine, which is positively Dostoevsky esque. Quote <laughs> For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And quote I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Neither yet bread to the wise, nor riches to the to the men of understanding, nor yet favor to the men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. For man also knoweth not his time, as he fi- as the fishes are taken up by the evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. Is it me, or did that start <laughs> with him saying there is no afterlife? It be- well, here's the thing, and and, and we're, we're going to get to this a little later, but we'll talk about it now. There are a, a handful of references to the Lord in this book. Yeah. Yeah. But most biblical scholars dispute most or all of them. They're added later because the only reason this book is in the Bible is because someone had to be like, what the fuck is this book doing here? Mm. So there is no talk of the afterlife. There is no uh, admonition to follow God because he's good. The only times he tells you to follow God is because God is basically a capricious evil force, like a hurricane. So you might as well do good because he's going to get you. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's so bleak. No, I love this. And after he does get you, you'll die and there will be nothing for you. Right. I love this ancient (laughs) Semitic existentialism, actually. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. He beat Nietzsche by thousands of years. Right. Good job. (laughs) Um, chapter 10 and 11 are another series of admonitions against uh, wealth and avarice. And once again, I remain baffled that anyone who claims this book is their moral compass, compass can feel anything but revulsion by the side of Trump. Chapter 12. Well, as we've discussed with the Bible, it, if it can mean anything, it, it means nothing. Right. But this book is, it, it, it's not unclear what the position of Koheleth is, what his mind is thinking. Yeah. Right. Like he hates People like Donald Trump. Yeah. Anyway, chapter 12 brings this whole sad affair to an end with a series of dire predictions, including this gem in verse 5. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, 
And desire shall fail because man goeth to his long home and the mourners go about in the street. Um, I'm not sure why a grasshopper is a burden, but, you know, it <laughs> well, ends they, with they this. eat all your shit. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Don't invite them in. They're like vampires. You have, exactly. to, you have to invite them in. <laughs> it ends with this obvious addition to try and make the book have any place in the Bible. Quote, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. As I mentioned a minute ago, this is a clear addition to the script. Yeah, that um, sounds nothing like anything that came before. Right. And not, not least because this was most definitely not the conclusion one would reach by reading this book. Yeah. Right. The only conclusion one can draw from this book is that life is shit, so enjoy yourself while you can because death is coming for us all. Yeah, this book is basically Roy Batty sitting on the roof in Blade Runner in the last moments of his <laughs> totally. life. Totally. <laughs> Right, totally. A, a coked out Rutger Hauer actually improvising those amazing lines, but that's what this whole book is. And then they add on, "In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen." <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, that is so spot on. Yeah. Um, now I did mention that I at the beginning that I, this may be the best book in the Bible, and it really might be. Not because of what most Christians think. Not because it is sublime wisdom. It isn't. It's because this is an honest and painful exploration about the emptiness that can haunt the soul. The human condition, yeah. yeah. All by a man who has clearly lost his faith and his faith in humanity, right? Like, it's, this is a bleak, dark, depressing book. Hmm. And, but it's, it's honest. Yeah. It's, you know, there are no false promises, no vain threats, and except for the tacit endorsement of slavery and some um, casual misogyny, well, that's just, not, that, that's just standard. Like, right. Yeah. And, and again, don't get me wrong. I don't mean to dismiss either of those things. It's just for a book in the Bible, you don't get much better than this. Yeah. So mostly, well, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say what's funny is, is that if, you know, if you watch a movie like River Runs Through It or something with the good guy pastor, you know, mm-hmm. the true humanist, he's reading one little sec, like, you know, the, the race is not to the swift or something like that. Exactly. And stop. And then they don't read, right. you know, six sentences on either side of that because everybody would run out of the church. But think about even that passage, <clears throat> the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, is, is a, a, an admission to the unfairness of the world. Right. 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 Like, you, what, what, what is the point? If you're fast and you can't win or you're strong and you can't be, be, be victorious. Uh, well, it's a statement about the Electoral College. <laughs> <laughs> not this time yeah uh, mostly this book is just a sad man staring out the window at a world he no longer has faith in lamenting the passage of time and the death of youth for some reason it speaks to me i don't know why <laughs> <laughs> weird weird so, <clears throat> for the life of me i don't know why this book is in the bible because it is so it's not it's the it's the crazy contradiction that it's in the bible and it is perceived as this sublime wisdom when in reality it is the most, you know, kind of distilled, ref, you know, refutation of anything else the Bible might have to say. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. It so, is, yeah, it's crazy how much, uh, like, how, how opposite of what you're supposed to take away from the Bible the, that book is. Yeah, it's truly. And, uh, you know, it, 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 to to end this, it, it it has a huge, perhaps more than any other book in the Bible, it has a huge presence in popular culture. Not mm. least because you know, a Time to Kill was a was a movie, and the you know, Turn 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 was <laughs> one of the most. To kill. What an amazing film that was! <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Like these, the, the it it kind of I, I won't put the litany out there, but there's a million references from this book. Yeah, in our popular culture. Yeah. Um, and one of my favorite is that in uh, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, Guy Montag uh, memorizes the book of Ecclesiastes, and that's his contribution to the, the afterscape, mm-hmm. is that book, which is, I find, a fascinating little nugget. Which is perfect in, about Fahrenheit, the, the bleakness of Fahrenheit 451, right? Exactly. I'm telling you, if 2020 goes, any, goes too much longer, I am going to have to do the same thing. I will memorize I, I will have nothing else to do, so I might as well. I'm right. going memori- to memorize the Celestine prophecy. That's going to be my You guys are going to stick me with memorizing Ezekiel. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, that's you. So there All you right. go. Well, There's to, the book to, of Ecclesiastes. To every segment, there is an end. <laughs> and this is it. Yeah. Moving on. Moving on. Moving on.